Okay. Well, welcome. Welcome to tonight's Let's Talk About Race. Um, I'm Linda Hewitt and I work at the uh, Red Bank Public Library. And I know I'm a bit biased, but I personally believe libraries are at the heart of all communities. And I think our library is an extremely active library and we do an array of programs. And this particular program is a personal favorite, quite frankly. We, we've been doing this program for nine years. Our, our ninth anniversary was in August. And in 2018, we won uh, the New Jersey National, the New Jersey State Libraries Award for best multicultural program in the state. And we're still trying to produce an array of programs that uh, engage our community, educate, and also tell people's stories. Um, we're really into celebrating at the Red Bank Public Library. We celebrate everything. And this month we are celebrating um, um, National Hispanic Heritage Month and we have a fabulous display and we have we're we're going to be a part of the celebration that's going on this weekend. Um, we've been doing a lot of construction at the library, which has disrupted some of our programming, but we are still pretty much trying to do everything that we have been doing. And we also produce a lot of things virtually. Um, once the the construction is done, which should be early in 2024. Our library is just going to be absolutely incredible, and we will be able to use our meeting room, which can accommodate almost 100 people, and do this program in person as well as virtually. So we're really excited about that. Um, also, this month is National Library Card Sign Up Month, so we have a free raffle going on. And if you don't have a library card and you live, work, own property, or go to school and Red Bank um, Regional, also any students that go to Red Bank Regional can get a library card. I really do encourage you to do so because it opens up a lot of doors. Um, also, uh, some of our program that I just wanna make note of, in the fall and the spring, we do, um, historic walking tours, and they really are great. They're done by a volunteer. They take place one Saturday a month, and um, we have one upcoming in October and one in November. In November, we'll be adding a few spots because in November also, talk about celebrating, it's gonna be a year of celebrating because the library celebrates 100 years as the Red Bank Public Library and the kickoff will be in November and then it will be a year of celebrating. There'll be a fundraiser, but you know, go onto our website and check out all the different things that we're doing. And also the last thing is we're doing a photo con uh, test that we started during COVID. The prizes are incredible. And we have not had a lot of applicants this year. I really encourage you, if you're at all interested in photography, taking pictures, please come and uh, submit your photographs. It's called Red Bank Always Beautiful Photo Contest. You'll find it on the website as well as an array of all kinds of programs. You can always contact us and uh, or send me an email. But tonight's program, um, we're really, really honored to have the um, presenters that we have. They've come together uh, very quickly to present this special program. So welcome everyone. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Patty White, who is on our Let's Talk About Race Committee and has some uh, things to tell you about Zoom. Patty. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yes, um, I'm a volunteer with the Red Bank Library, and thanks for the big pep talk about the library, Linda. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we're very excited for tonight's program. Um, I realize most of us uh, have learned how to use Zoom, but just a little reminder, um, when you're not speaking, if you could keep your device muted, um, that would be great. On occasion, all of us forget so if there's any background noise coming through, we may mute you, but you can unmute yourself or request to be unmuted. Um, certainly you're welcome to keep your cameras on or off, whichever. Um, 
for the presentation, um, we've got uh, Claire will be introducing our speakers. But once we open the floor to comments and questions, it's probably easiest if you put your, a note in the chat that you would like to, to say something, or you can um, hit the raise hand option if you know how to do that. Um, either way, we'll keep an eye on it so everyone has a chance to participate. Um, and just quickly before we introduce our speakers, I wanted to announce that next month's program, and we've been doing this every month now, uh, going into our ninth year. Um, next month, October 25th, Rick Gefkin, who is a local historian that many of you know, will be doing a program, another program, we've done this before, but it's a conversation that needs to keep on going on reparations, reconciliation and renewal in today's America. Uh, same time, seven o'clock, information will be on the Red Bank Library website uh, sometime soon. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Patty. Welcome everyone to our program tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by saying thank you to Linda also for um, letting us know about all the exciting things happening at the Red Bank Library. And I will start with our first presenter, um, which is Imani, Cru Imani Cruz. Imani is the Global Policy Coordinator for Migration Justice with the American Friends Service Committee, where she promotes policies driven by nonviolent Quaker values and impacted communities. Imani integrates her previous experience directly serving newly arrived families into her advocacy and holds degrees in sociology and public policy. She is a, she's proud to come from a diverse immigrant family and enjoys the great outdoors and traveling. Welcome, Amani. Um, our next panelist is uh, Gisela Galindo. Uh, she started at AFSE Immigrant Rights Program as an intern while studying at Montclair State University Paralegal Program. She's worked at AFSC for 13 years and that includes working with survivors of different crimes, DACA, and family reunification cases. Her current role at AFSC is supervising accredited representative. She lives in New Jersey, loves to read, and has two teenage daughters. Welcome, Amani. And our third presenter on the, the panel is Marisol Mundaka. She is the bilingual clinician for the source at Red Bank Regional High School and the advisor for the Dreamers Club. Um, the, the Dreamers uh, are with us this evening. There are four members. They are Madeline Sanchez Berra, Selena Martinez Santiago, Betsy Vera Varela, and Edith Lozano Zane. Marisol has extensive counseling experience. Um, she's been recognized for her work at Red Bank Regional. She has degrees from Ma Rutgers University and Monmouth University and has a private practice in Oakhurst, New Jersey. And we're so happy to have all of our panelists here this evening. And we will begin now with Imani Cruz. Imani. Thank you for that welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start today really doing a broad overview of what we're seeing with DACA right now in the courts. Um, and then I'll pass it on to my colleagues and co-speakers to really get more on the details of that. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, a Judge Hainan of Texas once again ruled against DACA. Um, this case has come before this judge again, and he ruled once again in the same way. Uh, but the difference is this time the case was more focusing on DACA as the rule that Biden put out last year. Um, originally, that we have been looking at Obama's memo from 2012. Um, and recently, Biden uh, put it more codified the memo into rules um, to kind of make strengthen it and make it more protected. Um, so now this case has restarted looking at that rule specifically. Um, Unfortunately, this was a negative ruling and Judge Hainan um, does not agree with DACA, but nothing has changed from what we're seeing, um, what we saw previously, which is that DACA renewals, people who currently have DACA are able to renew it. Um, and we do encourage that to continue. 
um, but no new applications are being accepted currently. Um, so many people who may qualify for DACA are not able to have that temporary protection. Um, and so what we're seeing with this case is that it will now go up to the next court um, in appeals, which will be the Fifth Circuit. It has been there previously. Um, and then uh, we are expecting that this case will be appealed again to the Supreme Court likely next year. Um, and I do want to just reiterate that no matter what happens with this case, um, myself, AFSC, uh, my colleagues, advocates will continue to work to protect immigrant youth, to protect DACA. Um, but we never want to lose sight that DACA is a temporary protection um, and that we are always calling for more permanent pathway to status, um, just so people are able to have stability, able to live their lives and not have constant fear and worry that everything will be ripped apart um, one day. And that also that they do not have to constantly go through the trauma of seeing this go through courts again and again and possibly being taken away um, through that or any other change of administration. So that's a really high level. Um, I'll leave it to my colleague Guzella to talk more about um, what that really means on the personal level. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. And yes, so now that the case is going to the fifth circuit, one of the things that is different from before is that, uh, yes, we can continue with renewals, but now the, the fifth circuit has the authority to change that. So that is something that worries us going forward. And we hope that we continue on this path. Uh, this program benefits about 600,000 people in total uh, nationwide. And I have uh, 150 clients in New Jersey that have DACA and just to see how they've been able, you know, I met them in 2012 and now fast forward to 2023, how they have gotten their careers, opened their own businesses, being now entrepreneurs and being able to support their own family and themselves has, has been really great. So one of the things that um, in the technicality, and this is getting into a little bit of what the legal, the legal things that are being questioned. So the the question that would be presented to the Supreme Court would be, was DACA constitutional, right? But then we have also the arguments in New York and in Texas. So if it would be only for Texas, we would be probably in, in bigger trouble. But because the New York case keeps the program alive and keeps it going, now, um, there was another case in front of the Supreme Court where the question now is going to be, and maybe this is a technicality, did the state have the right to question this that was issued by the federal government? So that would be technicality that can be, you know, uh, argued and in the legal legal field and legal battle, but then that would be what comes um, from the Supreme Court and we have to watch and see the decision in fall of 2025. So like Imani mentioned, the dragging on of these battles in court for so many years has always been something that not many people have uh, a way to green card and citizenship. And, and that is like when we have many programs, TPS for Citizens and National Soil Salvador, that stands for Temporary Protective Status, have also been around for over 20 years. And it continues also to be something that um, gets extended and extended. And then a few years ago, even um, terminated and then reinstated. So all that limbo is, is, is really not a solution to a bigger issue. And that's where we wanted you know, to invite all of us to talk about the bigger picture issue. Okay, hey, thank you very, very much, Gazella. Uh, I think we'll turn the program over now to Marisol. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much and good evening to everybody. Um, so I just, I think I wanted to start perhaps when uh, the Dreamers Club started at RBR. And um, when we started about seven years ago, this is our, we're just beginning our eighth year. Um, we really were born out of uh, the necessity to find a safe place for our students. At that time in 2016, 
um there was a um atmosphere of anti-immigrants and um immigrants were very scared they didn't have many places that they could um feel safe and we felt that uh because we had so many immigrants in our um uh, school community we needed a place where we could discuss the current issues that there were happening, but also scholarship opportunities uh, as being a DACA student or being an undocumented student, uh, places where nobody else was talking about this, this topics. And so in 2016, we, we began um, creating the spaces for the students and only started with approximately like 10 students. And it grew so rapidly uh, because I think it's what really the youth needed at that time. And uh, um, in our most um, successful, not successful year, but in the, because it, every year has been successful, but the year that we've had uh, more attendance, um, we had up to like 51 students join our club, clubs generally in a school or very small. Um, and right now we have about, uh, for our first meeting, we have about 33 students uh, show up for our first meeting. So we it's growing, the, the need is definitely there. And um, we've grown for from talking about um, college opportunities to uh, we expand it to cultural activities, you know, and, and um, exposing the students to cultural activities. So our, our mission statement was always to have a safe place where we everybody was welcome. It, it didn't matter if you were an ally, if you were a person just arriving to the United States, if you were first generation, if you were second generation. Because the other uniqueness about our club is that um, it we have a lot of mixed family status, mixed status families, which means that maybe we have a first generation student who's born here in the United States, but whose older sister has DACA, right? And so it, this is a family issue and or it may be a first generation student whose parents um, are undocumented, right? And so, um, and we also have allies. We have people that really uh, support um, our immigrant community and they're there to help us and support us. So, so we kind of developed, we grew so quickly, um, not just, in terms of talking about scholarship opportunities, but then we move into cultural activities that were pertinent to the community. And then um, we started to do some, um, our four pillars. So we have four pillars. Uh, we do um, a lot of community service. We always felt that we needed to show the community that not only we're part of the school, but also outside school. So within school, we were part of uh, any events that, that we were invited and outside the school, we participated in a lot of uh, community service. We do a lot of community service, particularly in Red Bank. Um, and so besides the cultural events, the community um, service and uh, the college application and opportunities, we also did some social justice that came with it. Uh, again, again, understanding uh, understanding that they do have rights and um, feeling a sense of empowerment by advocating for themselves or for their families or for their neighbors. Um, and so we've grown and this is, we started our eighth year and we're very proud of what we've done. We've never stopped even. Um, we've always very incredibly busy. We're a club that are very, very busy and our membership is always um lively and interested in participating so we include families we include the parents in informational activities so and i have here with me our four, well one of our students uh betsy is unable to attend but i have my officers um and i want to introduce them to you i have uh Edith lozano who is the president of the dreamers club and madeline sanchez who is the secretary uh, Selena Martinez Santiago, who's the treasurer, and Betsy Vera Varela, who's not here today, but she's the vice president. So I'm going to open the floor to them if they want to share something about their club. Very good. Welcome, ladies. 
Hello, my name is Edith. As Ms. Marcel said, I'm the president of the Dreamers. It's an honor being the president of this club. It's an amazing club. The I joined in my sophomore year. I'm pretty sure I joined my sophomore year. And it started as in talking with Miss Marcel. And then she told me a little bit of what's going on. And I joined because I was very interested of what we were doing, mostly volunteering work which I love volunteering and much of everything. Um, we had the pleasure to go to Washington and do lobbying with some. And that sophomore year was about immigrants. And it's, it kind of touched more about the topic and I enjoyed it more. So I kept going to the meetings. Then on my junior year, um, we had another lobbying too. It was an amazing experience. Me being there I also meet new people we experience we talk about something we don't feel comfortable talking with other cousins probably just because they won't understand what we go through or what happened in our lives so in that room we just all feel safe we talk about about a little of everything if they need help with anything uh we do some volunteering work with like Hispanic Heritage Month or translating with parents um then it became as in our president was leaving so i wanted to be president and here i am but it's an honor being in this club it's an amazing club and i feel safe and most of all included in this club thank you so yeah. much very very nice Um, so I'd like to add on to that. So as Ms. Marcel introduced us, my name is Madeline Sanchez, and I'm currently a senior at RBR, and I'm the secretary of the RBR Dreamers. Um, initially, I joined not only because my my parents have like um, undocumented status, but also because like I am a Red Bank resident, and, and I know that my a large part of my community, there's about twelve thousand residents in Red Bank, and then about a quarter of them are from a Hispanic background. And so, knowing that, and uh, given my philanthropic attitudes, I wanted to be able to do something to represent those people in my community. And I feel like with the RBR Dreamers, it's the perfect way to do that. Um, as Edith mentioned, we have lobbied in D.C. to senators, and that's something most people don't get to do. Um, the first year we went, we lobbied for um, immigration. And then the second year that we went, we uh, lobbied for uh, gun violence or the prevention of gun violence. And um, in terms of the future of the club, I would like to see us do more uh events within the community and also more advocating uh, for our community. In terms of DACA, I believe that there's around 100,000 students in the U.S. who could be DACA eligible, but they are not able to get DACA. And it's important to realize that uh, people who are eligible for DACA should be able to get it um, because the ability to attain citizenship shouldn't be limited to just a couple of people. I think a lot of people in the US have the idea that the only people who deserve to have citizenship are students who are bright or students who end up being valedictorians in their school. I say that any person who is eligible for DACA and who is undocumented should be able to go get it and provide for their family. Because at the end of the day, the people who come from different countries and don't originate from the US should be able to provide a better future for their families. And I just hope that we can continue to do that with the RBR Dreamers. I know that we're planning to be at the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration, which is at Riverside Gardens. And I hope that we can promote our club more, not only through the press, which we did um, with our Dream 4, but also in the community itself and also promote it within the school. 
and I hope that it has a it continues to have a place at RBR in the future. Could I just Very say good. before we go on to the next student, as far as being bright, I mean, Madeline, I know personally, I all of the students we have with us tonight are dynamite. But Madeline, when she talks about, you know, contributing to her society, she is an incredible student. She volunteers at the Red Bank Library. She volunteers at lunch break. She does an array of things for the Red Bank community in addition to that. And the, what I do want mentioned is what happened with the club at Red Bank Regional. And, you know, it's unique in how it was challenged recently. So I would like us to discuss that. But we talk about America as a diverse country, and yet we make it very difficult for people coming into our country to shine the way these students do. And they their stars are shining brighter than just about any star at stars that there are at the high school. So I think that needs to be said. Sorry to interject. Mm -hmm. I'm a cheerleader of Madeline's. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Madeline. That was wonderful. Okay. Um, hi everyone. My name is Selena Martinez. And as Ms. Marisol said, I am the right now two year president, uh, not president, oh my god, um, two year treasurer of the Dreamers Club. I was the, also the treasurer last year. And I think right now, as a senior, I've been in the Dreamers Club since I was a freshman. So I'm pretty sure that I'm the longest running member of the Dreamers Club right now, as I'm going to be graduating this year. But um, originally, I joined the Dreamers because my sister told me to. She really loved the club. She was part of that year where there were over 40, 50 members in the club. So it really inspired me to join. And like Madeline and Edith said, we did go lobbying in Washington in 2022 and 2023. And 2022, when we saw everything that was happening for immigration and we got the experience to speak out for immigrants and um, challenge the societal expectations that were put on them. I think shortly after that trip, it kind of made me realize that I wanted to do more than just be a member, which is why I ran for officer position and I thankfully got it. Um, but I think over the course of the four years that I've been a member, I've really seen our club grow and expand. We've got new members. Um, we have seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen, and it seems to me that most of the time with other clubs, usually they're made to like give students volunteer opportunities. But when it comes to our club, I notice that a lot of the members are happy to be there and they're happy to be involved in the events and celebrations and stuff, which is really heartwarming, especially uh, standing in front of them as an officer, because you kind of just see how much people appreciate the club. And we really do so much for our community. I know that's been repeated before, but um, there's just so many events that I was so excited to attend. For example, we attended the Hispanic Heritage Celebration last year and to be attending it this year is truly very exciting. And we know we'll have a lot of fun. And then in terms of other things, we've done things for our school with climate change weeks or, and then we've done, we worked at the middle school in terms of parent teacher conferences and translation. We've worked with the primary school numerous times for international night and other events. And um, in terms of what happened with um, at school with the Dream 4, I think it was a very unfortunate situation that no other student should have to be put in. But at the end of the day, we were able to see all the support we received and we were able to overcome the situation and just come out stronger at the end. So it was really heartwarming to see everyone there for us and also the number of people who put their names on the letter of support so I think at the end of the day we're all just very proud of what we're doing very proud of our club and it's really exciting to be here very good thank you so much Selena I believe now we can open up the floor to any questions or comments anyone has Marisol, I, do you want to just tell them what happened as far as the club being challenged? Um, no. It, 
I, I think that uh, the dream for, first of all, we're missing one of them. And so yeah. I really do not want to speak for them. Uh, and um, I, we, they've uh, really wanted to keep it separate. We wanted to speak up to um, the wonderful thing that it was to have the support and to be reinstated. And most importantly, a major issue, which is, you know, what's going to happen with DACA, what's happening with the students, you know, the students that we have right now in our club probably um, do not reflect the DACA because they miss the cutoff time, you know, they're a little, because they close the new applications, um, a lot of our students, maybe their older siblings were able to apply, but they were not able to apply. And so again, we in a predicament of a mixed status family and that's reflected in our, our club. But I think also it doesn't mean that we have forgotten that they are not forgotten, but on the contrary, that we continue to uh, advocate for, for the immigrants, for the immigrant community and for the DACA students. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, Gisela mentioned something about a case in New York. I don't know anything about that. I wonder if she could elaborate. So when the fight with DACA began, um, there were two cases and the New York case was favorable in the sense that they they help us to keep the renewals going. So the technicalities of what the argument is in each case is different, but the New York case also, it, it, it was kind of like reinstated the chance for everybody to do the renewals while the, everything else continues. So it was, um, that's the New York case. And Texas is where they keep arguing whether it was constitutional or not constitutional. And that's where the judge now uh, made the decision and is going back now to the Fifth Circuit Court. And the Fifth Circuit will have the chance to decide whether we continue to do the renewals or they can change that or they can just send it to the Supreme Court in the fall of uh, 2024 with a decision in fall of 2025. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Manny, you wanted to add anything on that? No, that was great. Thank you. We have a question from Liz. Um, what is the status of non-Hispanic student support to the club and its works? Any of you girls want to answer that question? I can take it. Um, I think that a lot of, well, our, a lot of our members are Hispanic, but we do have um, a large sum of representation. But I think our most important thing is wanting to get the club more out there and have our um, peers kind of learn more about it, which is why we engage in so many events and um, our upcoming Hispanic Heritage Assembly and school, I think will definitely um, promote our club more to show everyone what it's about. And I think um, these past few events have definitely given us some recognition and like helped people understand who we truly are. But I think going forward that will definitely make like a much bigger effort to have um, a little bit more diversity within the club. Good. Barbara can Monahan I, has her hand raised. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I also like add something? So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that everybody is welcome in our club. Um, our club in the school is predominant, predominantly in the majority are uh, Latino students. But uh, and I think this is what makes us unique because we are one club that um makes Latino make feel makes Latino feels that they have a place that they they feel safe uh, but that doesn't mean that nobody else is welcome you if you are non-Latino um you may feel a little intimidated walking into our room <laughs> so um but we are welcoming it's not like we're saying you cannot come on the contrary I think that day for the board education meeting with everybody, more than a hundred people show up. I think it show the girls and our officers that there is a lot of allies 
Uh, and it's important, you know, so when somebody walks in our, our room, we make sure that we acknowledge them, that we are friendly, that we introduce themselves, that somebody pairs up with them because we know what it feels to be the one and only in the room. So we know exactly what that feel feels like. And so we make sure that we go above and beyond to make people comfortable. I uh, just wanted to add that. Thank you so much, Marisol. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yes, Barbara Monahan has her hand up for a question. Yes, Barbara. Hi, can you, do you have to see me or can you hear me? No. We can, can hear, you hear you, yes. Oh, okay, good, That's good. Fine. First, I wanna say these are four remarkable, extraordinary young women. And they absolutely moved me beyond if I wasn't such a scaredy granny and afraid of driving when the weather says storms, I would have been there on September 11th and how. It's so upsetting to me that a person who sits on the board and has authority over any of our kids equates this club with an elitist sport like sailing. It blows my mind. The other thing I want to say is because I'm a daughter of Irish immigrants, I bring up, I made a poster about it in art class at the senior center. And I bring up when America despised the Irish because they did and how. We were thought mm -hmm. to be a tax on all the social welfare types of systems. We were thought to be dirty, ignorant, uneducated and diseased. We would, there were signs when my people came, there were signs that said, help wanted, Irish need not apply. Mm. There were signs in homes for rent that said, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. So to, you know, the saying is the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I don't know how some people from my generation, children of that 19th century immigrant crisis could forget. I don't, it's not comprehensible to me. I was taught when you arrive and you get something, you help the next person in line. And here, and here you are. I'm very proud of you girls. I hope to, I meet you Saturday. And I want to thank your moderator. Um, I, your name is Marisol. And you're also outstanding to volunteer and stick with these kids. Thanks so much. I enjoyed hearing everyone speak and uh, have a good night. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much, Barbara. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I was wondering, could uh, somebody please announce the details for the Hispanic Festival that's gonna happen on Saturday? Somebody mentioned it, but please give all the details, the time, the date, the place, what's yes. happening. It's supposed to be in Riverside Gardens is my understanding, correct? And I think it runs nine to two, uh, no, one, one to six. Mm -hmm. It was changed. It was last weekend, but because of the weather, it was changed to this upcoming weekend. Are the hours still the same as last weekend? Yeah, it's supposed to be at Riverside Gardens and it runs from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. Okay. What's that? I want Good. To okay. Thank you. Um, Barbara, did you have another question? Oh, I'll, put your, I'll put her hand up. I forgot to say something. Oh, okay. The man sitting at the table of the board who's voted no, his name ends in a vowel, which indicates 
he comes, his people come from Italy. And the great migration from Italy came after the Irish. And I can tell you, they were much less welcome than we were. Mm -hmm. The Italians, number one, they came from mostly Southern Italy and their skin wasn't white. Not like the Europeans, most of the Europeans. And they were thought to be dirty, ignorant gangsters. They brought the mafia. They were also ignorant and diseased. I can't remember what else I was going to say, but it would be good for him to remember that, to know mm -hmm. that. That's all. That's all. I'll be yeah. quiet. No. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Barbara. I mean, it's a, good to bring up points and to express yourself, express your opinion. Patty, another question? Jim has something. I, I just want to say that one of yeah. Madeline's um, uh, activities is uh, as the our new um, student representative on the Library Board of Trustees. Mm. Right. So we're very glad to have her. Yeah. Very, very good. That's nice. That's yeah. very good. So um, on Saturday with the um, Hispanic Heritage Celebration, it, it's from two to six. Yes. And what type of activities will be um, happening there? I can answer to that. that they're they're going to have food, uh, great music. Uh, some people are going to have some tables to... Um, provide some information. The dreamers are going to have a table there uh, okay. to talk to the people and let the people know who we are and what we do. Um, also the feminist club at RBR are going to have a, a table uh, assisting uh, children with activities. And I think the key club also from RBR is going to be there, but they usually have great music, mm -hmm. uh, great speakers, and uh, great food, all, all free of charge. So please come come, come down. It's a, it's a great celebration. Very the library good. is planning to be there too. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yes, they will. Um, in the chat, Amani has uh, sent a message to everyone about statistics on how dreamer demographics differ now from when DACA started in 2012 and specifics to New Jersey. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show, chat. I just wanted to share um, just for your advocacy, just for your knowledge. I know oftentimes people think DACA and people are often thinking, you know, oh, they're all still kids. Um, but a lot of this is showing that now that DACA, you know, that's my age group that we are working, having their own children. Um, and then often a lot of these younger people are coming, do not, no longer qualify for DACA. Mm -hmm. um, and also this offers some specifics to New Jersey. Um, currently, by their estimations, 14,000 DACA recipients live in New Jersey, um, and 18,000 U.S. citizens live with a DACA recipient. recipient. Um, so just some great things if you want to look through, just understanding um, the context a bit more and also use it in your advocacy for my students who are yeah. keeping on the good fight. And I'm not sure that everybody understands exactly what DACA is. I mean, is it's correct that every two years, you have to renew your residency, is that correct? So, so with the DACA program, you are granted a work authorization card and that everybody is not like when you hear of the temporary protective status, they all have to, they all have the same validity for the work authorization card. For DACA is individual. Whenever your application was approved, that's when you got your two years and then you have to renew every five months. Every, I mean, before five months before the expiration date. So it would mm -hmm. be uh, during COVID, they were kind of more lenient about the five months. They were getting them six or seven months before, but now they're very strict about the five months before the, the expiration date. And then um, you submit is a $495 to, for the Homeland US Department of Homeland Security payment every time you apply. Uh, there's no option to ask for a waiver. And then you 
you continue to ask, you know, security questions. Have you ever been arrested? Have any issues on, or you go through all these questions with the representative that fills it out and then you sign it and send it out. Uh, when the program started, the work authorization card application form was a one page. Now we are to seven page application. Uh, it's just pretty much asking the same questions, but in, in different ways and multiple time. And we always tell client not to let it expire. Like if you do let it expire, they do have a granting period of like a grace period of a year to do it. But after the year, you have to reapply it as a new application. Uh, so then, and that, you know, it's it's a problem because those are part of the group that will not be adjudicated. So we always said as close as possible to the expiration date, if it has expired, you can still apply it, but do it as soon as you can, because some employers will not, is no one of the groups that is automatically extended the category for the DACA work authorization. So if you, if your employer has to request a new one or wait for you to get the new one, they can put you on a temporary leave. Uh, some employers are more lenient. They're like, just bring me proof that you apply for the renewal and you can be on the payroll, but others are not. So that's why the five months, that's usually how it takes them to process them. So we encourage them to always apply in time. And and can I just add something to what Giselle was saying? Mm -hmm. That yes. everything that she was explaining, then it makes uh, the DACA recipients to feel, to be um, in the limbo really all the time, you know, all the time, really not knowing what's going to happen. Uh, and so if somebody had asked in the chat, what can we do, right? What can people do? I think uh, DACA was originally created to just be used temporarily. And um, really what we need to ask is for a permanent pathway to citizenship to all of those students that were eligible for DACA and for all the immigrants in general that have lived here all their lives. Right. Um, because if not, then the DACA students will continue to be in the limbo, being right. afraid that when the um, administration changes, would, is this administration going to be uh, friendly to the immigrants? Are they going to cut the services? And now these DACA, DACA recipients are adults. They have jobs, they have and homes, they have businesses, wins. they have, when I was in the high school, they had just begun doing their process and being so hopeful for being able to go to college or to drive. They were so excited they could finally have a driver license or have a work permit that would allow them to work a little farther away, a better job, to drive uh, and not be afraid. Uh, and, and now those DACA recipients are grown and they have families and they have. And so for them to live in the limbo and to be to be afraid that anything can change at any moment that it will be challenged. It's just not right. It's it. You know, we really, really need to begin to say when we've been asking for a permanent pathway for a long, long time and nothing mm -hmm. has, they have not delivered and they, it, it's time, it's time to do that. It's just my team. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Marisol. Valerie Brett has her hand up. She has a question or had a question. Valerie, are you still with us? Uh, yes, thanks. Well, first oh. of all, I wanted to say to the high school um, girls, just amazing. Thank you for sharing your stories and, and your honesty and your enthusiasm for the club. Um, I understand a little bit of the um, what went on uh, in terms of the club, I guess maybe almost closing down and then support throughout the community. And I just, I applaud you for um, your leadership uh, at your age, just amazing. Um, I guess my question, it's it's a little bit more expansive in view, and I think I'm asking this to the AFSC folks, potentially. I noticed um, one of the uh, young women said, you know, my parents are uh, not documented. And, you know, we're here, and I think what we all believe is kind of a safe harbor of New Jersey, that somebody can say that uh, without fear of retribution for her parents. 
Um, and I'm just curious if in your work, the AFSC folks uh, across the country, you know, is that uh, openness standard or is there, or do, or I imagine some people are ha still having to hide their immigration status. Um, and how do you, um, how do you work with and how can allies support um, folks in that position? You want me to come in? <laughs> so in the in the organization first is like kind of like expanding that little dreamers club into a bigger national scope. We try to provide um, a, a safe place for people to come and ask questions just because it's not not always and we have to remember immigration law has not changed since 1996 and only Congress can change immigration law. So this is uh this is how it under the Obama administration this was created as an executive action and that is something that that's why it's being kind of like argued in court was the executive branch the one that had the power to do this and if they did then it was that constitutional and then all these other issues that have been argued back and forth throughout the circuits and now going up to the fifth circuit so the having that space a lot of people uh the dynamics of multi-status families you know what can be done sometimes because uh grand restrictions like one organization can represent the child but they cannot represent the parents or the parents have no way of obtaining any status because there's just no way um, the law doesn't allow them to apply for anything at this time. So it's always like keeping them informed. When that can happen and, and it passed, a lot of people were afraid because you didn't know if the application was going to be approved. You didn't know if missing that one requirement of the physical presence or the continuous resident was going to affect you. And you were putting your name, address, information on the application. So we encourage always uh, we have to advocate. It's something that in the long run is, was going to benefit them. It was worth a try. They were in a school. They needed it to advance in their education. And now, like I said, I've had the chance to see them grow and see how some of them are now, you know, class B drivers and like they're taking the test for the other license and they're driving across country and they have their own businesses with their their parents, you know, things that they never thought that they could do, but there's also a lot of information that they still need to know, like, how can I do this with my business? How, because they are doing this for the first time, many times in their family. So it's something that we encourage and we encourage them as they go to school, there's other organizations like the Latin uh, Association for Professionals to stay connected, even in college, to keep finding this safe space that can keep their network going to be able to keep growing personally and professionally. And, and that is something that we always try to do. So you will always, you know, like we've talked, one of the, the speakers mentioned how you can never convince everybody. And, you know, um, it's just as an organization, we always are founded in this Quaker value that we see the light in everyone. And migration is a big issue, not only in the United States, but look at the scope of the entire world. It's something that is being forced in communities and in populations for multiple reasons. And then the, the US is one of the places that we're, we're seeing it. And, and But it's not only here and these argument about what is a fair and safe space and what is what is the law how can they change and what do we need to do this action i think is needed around the world very good thank you so much imani put in the chat that you can send a letter to your member of congress through afsc calling for a pathway to permanent status for all 11 million undocumented people living here in the United States. And there's a link there in the chat. Um, 
there's a comment from Barbara, from Sue, I'm sorry. Thank you, Amani, for sharing that article. Uh, the statistics are amazing. I had no idea how much things have changed in the last decade with dreamers attaining higher levels of education and employment. It's a wake up call to realize that time did not stand still. And another thank you from Valerie. And Patty is asking, what can each of us do? I think writing the letter was one of the responses to what we can do. What One thing we always try to do in this program is we present problems and then we try to present some solutions of how we can be a part in making a positive difference with a lot of things now more uh, immigrants are coming into the country than ever. And I think it was also interesting. I think it was Barbara that said um, when the Italians were coming in that people were saying that they were ignorant because they didn't um, speak English. And still these comments are made. If anybody here has traveled, um, maybe you have an affinity for languages. I do not. And I find one of the most challenging things when I go to another country, it's easier now with Google, but um, speaking the language is not easy. And somebody coming into our country and all the challenges that there are, and then to learn English um, on top of that, it's tough. And that's why, you know, there are many ESL classes and things, but when you're working three jobs and you're also trying to learn English and fit into a society that might not be that welcoming, it, that's a pretty tough challenge. Yes, we always true. said uh, when the program for DACA was announced, we always said their parents were the original dreamers, right? It's yeah. like they did everything for their children to have the opportunity to have the education right. that they didn't have. And that comes with a big weight also. They were the first interpreters in the house, translators and everything that they they had to do at home. Um, but yes, so that's why it's a bigger call for a permanent status for those that have been here for way longer too. Yeah. Because then yeah. when, when you have to explain to like a family, um, there is that, you know, like having two siblings that one has the status and one does not, it is really hard and difficult because then they, the opportunities are not the same. The, the scholarships are not the same. Right. You know, the, everything is, is just like you can, you put yourself those limitations. And of course, in a family dynamic, at one level is you're going to notice the difference whether you you know you want to see it or not yeah and can, can see... i also go ahead yes. sorry i'm being bad i guess i should raise my hand oh, no, <laughs> that's okay no no uh, I, I just want to add something to what uh Giselle, i was saying that uh per and personally what i do tell my students all the time and when i tell anybody that says um I want to help. I'm an ally. I always say, and we had actually in the high school, we run a voters registration uh, campaign for like about three years with the uh, uh, Mammoth County Women Voters um, League. And um, we, I would say my recommendation will be vote, please, those that can, please vote and be conscientious of who you're voting if if you're an ally, if do they have do they believe what I believe? Do they stand for what I stand? Because that matters. Uh, the DACA recipients cannot vote. Um, students that get uh, asylum, they can't vote. So if you have that, and I always tell my students, this was it was so important to register the students really early because they could understand that. Whatever their their ideals were, right? We were not going for one or the other, but we were saying you have the power to change your things. You need to vote, 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 vote. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Voting is is very strong. It's very very important. It changes things. Yes. Thank you so much. I was also going to add. Um, 
just I feel like in general, our club really emphasizes the idea of like being tolerant to everyone and kind of avoiding ignorance, you know, educating yourself. Um, there's this quote that I recently heard and it's like, it says English is a language and not a measure of intelligence. So it's to be cognizant of that. And the fact that, you know, if someone doesn't speak English, it's not, it doesn't mean that they are dumb or they don't have any sort of education. You know, it's just like a barrier that we have um, in the U.S., but that doesn't mean that they can't have access to like education, having like a well-paying job. Um, and in terms of DACA, you know, that also shouldn't be like a barrier um, in general too, so. Okay. And that is Madeline, um, we recently had a program and we had a librarian who um, is Latino and she was out with her whole family and they were speaking Spanish, but they all spoke English very well. And people in the restaurant were being negative and they could understand what the people in the restaurant, I mean, if you look at who the intelligent people in that conversation were, the people in the restaurant were derogatory about the librarian and her family because they were speaking Spanish. And they were, you know, saying, well, the least they could do is speak English if they're in this country. And meanwhile, they understood everything that was being said about them. So what so you said about intelligence, I think that's proven again and again. Yes, that seems to happen. Imani did have to sign off yeah. and she did say thank you to everyone and to have a great night. Um, Barbara made a comment saying, she'll say it. She says, vote for Democrats, drum up some interest for the Board of Ed seat in Little Silver. So that's her comment for tonight. Um, we will read we post the statistics information and then the link. Um, Valerie was having trouble retrieving that. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Gisela yes. did that. Yes. Um, and Barbara says, the only people who say speak English are those who only speak one language. Hmm. Interesting point as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I would like to add, <clears throat> Uh, in response to something you just said, Linda, um, Americans, people from the United States, um, historically, when they travel to many, many different countries in the world, always expect people to speak English to them. Um, and yet, when people come here and they don't know English right off the bat, right. uh, we get all worked up. And... Mm. Um, I have to say, I, I'm a native English speaker, um, but I learned Spanish and I've worked at it. And Spanish is, compared to English, it's a much easier language to learn. English is very difficult because of um, the, the blend of um, um, many different languages and cultures from around the world and the pronunciations, it's very, very difficult for a non-native to learn it. So um, yeah, I'm glad we're talking about this. Yeah, And I just would like to remind our participants, we do not engage in uh, political conversations, um, mm -hmm. but, we, but we always appreciate uh, people's input. Thank you. And what Michael said, the Democrats don't have all the answers. And that is exactly, we, we try very hard not to engage in politics. Just conversation about change, but an education, but not politics. We have enough of that elsewhere. We sure do. <laughs> we sure do. Does anybody else have any questions or anything they'd like to add to the conversation tonight? I wanted to ask the girls what the ones that are graduating uh, this year, what are their plans for the future?
Um, I guess I'll start. So I want to uh, major in electrical engineering. Um, I really like with uh, circuit boards and electricity. I like putting, I like taking apart like um, computers or honestly anything I can get my hands on that has a circuit board and then just like trying to put it back together. Um, and then the dream school would be Cornell, but I can settle for Rutgers or RPI too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's always wonderful to dream and dream big. Um, I can go next. Um, my current, I want to pursue a nursing degree. And ever since like junior year, um, but I was also considering going to pursue a career in, as a physician's assistant. And my dream school would probably be um, the University of Pennsylvania. But like Madeline said, I could also settle for Rutgers. So. I am still figuring out, but I am, I'm a dental assistant right now. I decided to do vocational school with high school. So I'm a dental assistant and I'm working in a dental office, but my plans change and I really want to go as a dental hygienist, but for kids. And I will go mm. to school. Yeah. Working out the school. Yes. I like hearing all of your goals and dreams and as I said keep dreaming big don't give up Barbara's thanking everyone for a wonderful night thanks to her for participating also Claire um there uh Gazella put in their statistics on how dreamers demographics differ now from when DACA started in 2012 so there's a link in there as well. Okay. I, I yes. did wanna ask a That question. was another link. Uh, that was a repeat. Yeah. Someone couldn't get okay. onto it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, for a while we were hearing so much about ICE. Is, I mean, this is off DACA, but is ICE still going into families' homes and taking people out of their home? That was actually one of the uh, first, what the priorities changed. So ICE has this priority list of who they detain. And under the previous administration, it was everyone who was undocumented. And that's mm -hmm. where the, the fear increased. Uh, now it went back as that was one of the first actions the president Biden took it was to go back to the old standard like it, if it's if it's not someone who has committed a major crime then it's okay you, you know you're not they're not going to come and knock on your door um mm -hmm. a lot of people have because the system has not changed and we go back to like you know back in the 90s you could have received a final order of deportation without you knowing because you gave the address or where you entered, let's say in Texas or Arizona, and then you didn't know where your final destination was going to be. So you, uh, unbeknown to you, you could have a deportation order, and that's that that could trigger somebody to look up with your name, and that's when ICE was doing the detainers and being like, you had a deportation order from back in 1982, 88, 87, and. Uh, People didn't know that that was there or they didn't receive the final notice or many things could happen. Uh, so that was one of the things. But no, uh, right now we have not heard of that happening. And even AFSC is also a big advocate for closing the detention centers. So the one in Elizabeth uh, that had very poor conditions uh, was closed. But then the effect of that is that then they they're they taking them now to Pennsylvania or to other detention center where, where it's more remote. It's harder for attorneys to get in touch with clients and mm -hmm. that like uh, another effect of, of that happening. But right now, no, the priorities have reversed to the old ones and not is not everybody anymore. But that could change, correct? Yes, that can change. Mm. Anybody else?
I, I, uh, Patty had put in the chat uh, our next month on October 25th, which is the last Wednesday of the month, we'll have Rick Gethgen, who is a local historian, and he'll be presenting reparations, reconciliation, and renewal in today's America. As always, it will be a program you have to register for, and it will be remote. Um, we always like to have a nice, large audience, so spread the word. And we have Claire Garland. Claire, I, I don't know if you could unmute, Claire is being honored this weekend. I believe Claire Hi. is. <laughs> Hi. You want to tell us about what's happening um, over the weekend? My kids are uh, excited about my essay that was published mm -hmm. by Rutgers. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. kind of throwing a little party for me. Yeah. So uh, it's nice of them. Well, Claire hangs out with the governor a lot. So uh, <laughs> Claire has got to done, shake his hand. Yeah. Well, he got to shake your hand. <laughs> That's the way you need to look at it. But mm -hmm. uh, Claire has um, been an active member of Let's Talk About Race and has presented several programs. And do you want to tell them just a little bit about the museum? Uh, the uh, we just set up an exhibit at the Ocean Township Museum. Uh, they opened an exhibit called First Nations and included our Sandhill family, uh, some of the collection in that uh, exhibit. I think it'll be there until spring. Mm -hmm. um, they were involved in, in uh, clearing uh, a, a very large piece of property in Ocean Township. And in doing that, they um, had archaeologists uncover um, an, a, a village, a First Nations village of people that used to be there. And they were able to do all kinds of scientific research and information and uh, collect it all. They've got reports. It's really quite documented. And uh, everything they found, they have um, uh, re recorded and photographed, and some of it is on display. So it's uh, we were included in that exhibit. It's very beautifully done. So it was nice to be included. Mm -hmm. That is very nice. I also, um, I wanted to just make a couple of other announcements before we end, but um, so thank you all for sharing about the Hispanic festival this Saturday. I think it's from two to six o'clock. Is that correct? Yes. yes. At the Riverside Gardens, but um, there's also another event going on on Sunday, October 1st. Um, a lot of you know Gilda Rogers. She has been, she has presented for us for Let's Talk About Race in the past. She is the executive director of the T. Thomas Fortune House in um, um, right here in Red Bank. She's giving a program um, on Sunday, three o'clock at the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House over on West Front Street on um, Black, wait a minute, Black um, Press. I'm sorry, Black journalism. So she's calling it Black Press Stewards of Democracy um, because that's the new exhibit at T. Thomas Fortune. So this is a free event Sunday at three o'clock at the Unitarian Meeting House. And also uh, Gilda is partnering on October 20th with Rick Gefkin, who's gonna be our October presenter. And I know you probably can't see this very well, can. but um, if it's at Brookdale Community College at their lifelong learning um, adult education, it's an all day program, October 20th on black founders of Monmouth County. So it's a little um, um, local history of, um, you know, things that we don't often know about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as always, we are always looking for program ideas, uh, presenters, um, 
suggestions, um, anyone who would like to help us plan future programs, please reach out to Linda or myself. And um, thank you. There's also um, a bus. Uh, Rick Gapkin and Gilda are doing a bus tour of three oh. historic places in October. That's what, yeah, that's uh, what this is. Yeah. The thing on October 20th. They're going to tour um, the old uh, Tinton Falls Ironwork site, the Marl Pit Hall in Middletown, and then the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center. Right. Go right. on the Brookdale website. You could get information. Okay. Thank you, Patty. We had one more question from Liz. Um, she said she had kind of a personal question. If I try to speak Spanish because someone doesn't speak English and I sound, as she put it, a little like a babbling idiot, does that offend people? She said her Spanish is far from good. So I guess if she's trying to speak, um, do people that are speakers, are they offended? That was a, a question for someone. Um, personally, I mean, uh, I'm not really sure if I'd be offended. I think I would only be offended if it was like in a mocking way. But I mean, it's like we don't, I know a lot of people like, speak Spanish, but it's not like it's only our language. I mean, you can learn the language and as long as you respect it, I think it's fine. And honestly, I'd probably just try to correct you in terms of intonation, but not... Mm -hmm patronizing way just sort of helping you learn the language but for me personally I don't take it as an offense as long as you as long as you respect it I'll respect you thank you Madeline yes mm -hmm. I, I would add that that has been my experience as well my Spanish is not bad now but it used to be pretty terrible um, and the only time I ever got laughed at was by a couple of teenage girls who just were were being goofy. Um, but almost everybody that I've tried to communicate with in Spanish, um, if I didn't get it right, they were very, very, very patient with me. Okay. Anybody else? Linda, our presenters, do you have any last things to leave us with? I just wanted to say that um, in, in AFSC, one of the things that we use to represent us is the butterfly, the migration butterflies. And it is amazing to learn how far they travel and how long it takes them. So is just one thing that I encourage you. I'm sure the library has yeah. a lot of things about that. Well, monarch also, butterfly. One of the things we always talk about is reading multicultural books. Uh, is I just fi finished Isabella Lende's new book. And for those of you who have not read Isabella Lende, um, she's one of my favorites. Um, she has an incredible history. She came from Peru. And Chile, I think Chile was her original home. And there was a coup done that affected her family. And she had to flee. And she currently lives in um, California. She's an amazing woman personally. But her literature, like when you read authors from different cultures, and again, it's about their stories and you understand somebody else else's story. We did a multicultural book club for several years at the library because, I mean, white people tend to read white authors and white, I remember a white man said to me, oh, I would never read a woman author. Like you need to read an array of authors and books open up a whole world. I mean, you don't have to converse in conversations, just read and read something that put you a little bit out of your safe environment. And maybe it does make you feel uncomfortable, but that's a good thing. And so, you know, I would 
certainly be uh, remiss if I didn't say end this with, it's really good to read. It could be electronically, it could be a book, but please read and read an author that you've never read before. And I guarantee you it might make you think differently. So. Is the mic still on? Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Oh, yes, yes we can. Okay. <laughs> I want to mention that Channel 13 has a episode right now. It's called, or story, Becoming Free to Kahlo. And the- Oh, yeah. It's a great show. Yeah. yeah. So I want to mention that if anyone was interested. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, it's, it's a great show. So that's- Sorry. Sorry for saying that. No, it's don't be show. sorry. We, we want to hear what you have to no, say. No, that was I good. Said, I saw I part of that last week. It was very I good. Said TV. <laughs> oh, well. Thank you, nope. Barbara. That's great. Anyone else? Yes, Marisol has a question. I, I, I just had a, uh, have a comment. I, wa I wanted to thank uh, the Red Bank Library and you ladies for putting this um, uh, event together. I think it's important that we begin to have discussions and conversations. Um, some of these topics are uncomfortable, but I think mm -hmm. we're role modeling for our um, e youth to be able to, to find spaces where we can have conversations where we could be respectful, even if we disagree, that we can hear each other out. And also um, it's important that we, we gotta start somewhere, uh, mm -hmm. right? These conversations right. are incredibly important. And I want to tell my dreamers know that I am incredibly proud of them and what they do every day for four years, 10 years, all the years that um, they are so active. They're, they are the future. It is so amazing to see that they are going to have, they have the future in their hands and they're going to make changes. I am certain that they are going to make changes. They're already making changes and I'm incredibly proud of them. So... Well, and rightly so, how many of us are going and talking in front of senators? I mean, there is Claire who's hanging around with the governor, but the rest oh. of us. <laughs> Adia, thank you, ladies, and thank you for everything you do every day. Yeah, we feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you next month. Linda? Okay, good night. Thank you. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again to our